If Ingmar Bergman took speed and loved blood, then he would make a film like this. Welcome to a special international episode of the Road to the Movies podcast, a dark label production in collaboration with Movie Scene, Sweden's biggest movie website, and Tell Us Story, home of creators. How does someone from Denmark end up sound designing a Hollywood movie? Today's guest is sound designer Peter Albrechtson, who will reveal his road to Evil Dead Rise. We talk about digging into the original Evil Dead audio tapes with Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi, the importance of silence in horror movies and much more. Enjoy this inspiring and funny conversation with Peter Arbrechtson. Peter, welcome to Sweden's uh, number one filmmaker to filmmaker podcast. Thank you um, so much. Uh, have you heard the Roger Dickens podcast? I heard his podcast. I thought he had been a guest on your podcast. No, no, I'm not there yet. Then the universe will implode when like the wannabe deacons meet him. Then we'll all get sucked into a black hole. Starting off, what is a sound designer? A sound designer is in many ways kind of the ears of the director. So I'm trying to make sure that we're telling the story in the best possible way for the ears. So... A sound designer is um, really very much a storyteller, but with the sound. And when I'm involved in a project like Evil Dead Rise, then I'm part of it already from the script stage, so that I get involved uh, very early on to talk about like how can sound be a big and important part of this film? Uh, how should this film sound? Um, and uh, then I'm there all the way until the very end and we finish the mix. There's a lot of sound design in Evil Dead Rise. There's so much sound all the time, um, creating the sounds of, like, all the many different, like, ugly things happening to different people's bodies and um, all the way to how the environment sounds to how does the supernatural things sound and um, there are so many things we needed to create unique sounds for in this film so as a sound designer I was also just like spending a lot of time on creating special sounds for all the different things you see which doesn't I mean how does like a dead-eyed sound, how does a zombie sound, how sh how does the voice sound, how does it sound when Ellie is moving, how does it sound when you get stabbed in the arm, how does it sound when, like, um, an uh, elevator is falling apart. Um, there's so many things in this film where sound plays a very important role and uh, it was really like it was an, an, an enormous challenge but also a lot of fun creating this uh, sound design of Evil Dead Rise. And, and how did this project first come to you? What was the first you heard of Evil Dead Rise? They wrote me very early like already when I mean before they started shooting the film and um I'm based in Copenhagen, Denmark, but I'm doing a lot of international projects. I got recommended for this job by an Irish sound designer, Lee Cronin, the director and scriptwriter of Evil Dead Rise, is Irish. Uh, he got me recommended and then we met and we just totally hit it off. Like uh, Lee Cronin is really into sound. He's very passionate about sound. When reading the script, like the first thing in the script was sound, like a description of sounds. Um, and like so many scenes in the film, it's really based around sound. I think it's one of the most kind of the script with the one of the scripts I read with most sound written into it. So it was very obvious that Lee really wanted to explore what sound can do so i was part of the film from very early on and then um i actually started uh 
doing sound design already from when they started editing the film. So I worked on the film for eight months and collaborated constantly with the picture editor and the composer. I mean, it was a long, long, long journey to create the sound. Normally on a Danish feature film, like just in comparison, then you would work on a Danish film for like three months maybe. But yeah, this was eight months. So then I did, I started out working um, a few months here in Copenhagen and then we did remote work while like Lee and the picture editor was in Ireland. So we sent files back and forth and then I came to Ireland for a couple of months working with uh, Lee there and then we mixed the film in Copenhagen for two months. What's your process when you get a script? Yeah, I make a lot of notes. I also, I mean, for me, when reading the script, I almost see it as a kind of grocery list because there's so many sounds I need to get hold of. I record a lot of sounds all the time. I always walk around with a little hard disk recorder and record sounds. So... um, I mean, I'm always looking for sounds. For this, we, I mean, there were so many sounds when you read the script that you knew, like, I just knew I had to get hold of all these special sounds, like elevator sounds, sound of an old book we got hold of, like a hundred year old book from a library, from a local library, which, which we recorded for this film, for the Book of the Dead. And, um, I mean, there were so many things that just when reading the script that you knew, okay, it's going to rain all the time. We will need a lot of different rain. There'll be all these electrical sounds because the whole electrical system in the apartment is falling apart. We need sounds for that. We need um, a lot of um, sounds of bones crackling and blood and (laughs) all those things. So we could start collecting a lot of sounds very early on. So that's one of the things I do when I read the script. But then it's also about like just talking with the director about like, okay, so how will we make these scenes where so much about it is about listening? So there's a lot of scenes in the film where like you have a character or characters who are listening for things, hearing things, hearing sounds. And um, Lee got a few sounds that he then played on set for the actors so that they knew what kind of stuff was going on. So it's also a question of making the actors aware of all the sounds that will surround them. Because, of course, when you're shooting the film, you don't want all those sounds playing around the actors because you want to record the dialogue as cleanly as possible. So um, it's uh, it's this thing where like everything you hear in the film apart from the dialogue is made afterwards. It's just like built from hundreds of tracks of sounds. I... When we were mixing the film, at one point we reached uh, 666 tracks of sounds and uh, we thought that was a very special moment because of the demonic quality of the film. So we were very proud of that. I see a ghost behind you, man. (laughs) When you made your notes or thinking of like potential, when you're making a grocery list, I can imagine your first list doesn't always match up with with, with what will be the actual challenge while making the movie. I can imagine it's like the smallest maybe LP record player needle. That's the hardest thing to do. Damn, that needle doesn't sound right. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, you keep on developing sounds all the time. I mean, um, for the vinyl players, I mean, I got hold of a Danish DJ that I knew from like for many years because I wanted to have the proper sounds of old 78 vinyls and like old record, pl- I mean, the, the right record player, the right sound of a pickup going into a vinyl and all these things. So yeah, there were lots of places where like you have an original idea and then you keep on developing. And because we also had eight months uh, of 
like there's several scenes where we've done many passes with a lot of sounds. I mean, trying things out and kind of seeing, okay, does this work? How How is this scene working if there's no music? How is this scene working if there's a lot of music? How is this scene working if it's half sound, half music? How is this scene working if we hear a lot of breathing from the character? How is this scene working if we're playing it very quietly? There were so many ways of interpreting like a lot of the scenes in this film because of how important the sound was to Lee. He really wanted to kind of explore that and play around with things. So he really he really inspired me to be very playful and also try out a lot of things. Do you see any difference when like mixing for the cinema or mixing for television? Do you approach things a bit differently or is it do you do it the same? This was this project was quite special because originally the idea was that the film should go to HBO Max and not to the cinema. So because of COVID, then the plan was to distribute it digitally and stream it. Um, but Lee was all the time saying that we should really try to be cinematic and really use sound um, like very boldly and very, I mean really have a lot of layers of sound in there. And um, sometimes on TV, because you have, like, quite often you have less time to do it, and it, it uh, and TV things are also often quite dialogue-based, that sound doesn't play as prominent a role. I mean, you can do amazing sounds for for TV stuff, but um, for for Evil Dead Rise, like Lee Cronin was just all the time talking about sound as something that should be really enveloping. You should be in the middle of the sound. So um, from the beginning, we um, we decided to mix the film in Dolby Atmos to really create a very enveloping sonic environment so that you were totally surrounded by the sounds that were happening and you were really like inside of that apartment together with the characters because you were surrounded by the sounds and that's this amazing thing that sound in for cinema can do that you can really create this enveloping and very kind of visceral quality to the sound and um also, this layered, uh, I mean, many, many, many layers of different sounds. But then at the same time, Lee was also like, he didn't want this to be a wall of sound. He didn't want it to just be like, okay, you just be loud all the time and then just a lot of crazy sounds on top of each other. He wanted like every sound to be very specific. So the 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 sound design in the film, it has a lot of layers but it also has a lot of silences. So it has this dynamic of kind of being sometimes extremely brutally loud and sometimes very, very quiet. And that dynamic is also a big part of the suspense and the horror because it becomes so unpredictable. Okay, suddenly it becomes very loud and then it's very quiet. And all, I mean, then you're automatically sitting on the edge of your seat. Is there an Evil Dead like sound vault? Like, you know, in Star Wars, the lightsabers sound a certain way. You know, I can imagine in uh, what they call Skywalker Ranch, they have uh, like the vault with all the sounds. And since there have been uh, a lot of uh, Evil Dead movies and Sam Raimi's involved in this movie, did you get access to any like actual sound recordings or was it more like watching the movies on, on DVD? Actually, one of the very first things that happened when I got the job was that I got a hard drive with all the sounds from the first two Evil Dead movies um, digitized. Um, I mean, those movies were made back in the 80s and were made back when everything was recorded on tape. So they had digitized um, 
recorded it all into a computer so that I could have all these sounds. And it wasn't just it wasn't just the sound mixes of the original films. It was the actual sound effects recordings. So it was like you could hear that it was from an old tape. So it was like violent scream, take one, beep, ah, violent scream, take two, beep, ah. So it was all these sounds that uh, Bruce Campbell and um, Sam Raimi uh, recorded together. They did a lot of the sound themselves together with this uh, technician uh, back on those first two movies. So I got all that, all those original sounds, and some of those sounds are actually in the new film. One of the first sounds you hear in the film is a fly. And that exact same fly is the fly that opens the very first Evil Dead film. And if you're a really hardcore Evil Dead sound nerd, then you can hear several of the old sounds kind of playing in the new film. Because we wanted to kind of build on that whole legacy of the old Evil Dead sounds and then kind of bring that up to date and make it modern. So uh, then when I was in Ireland, uh, then um, Bruce Campbell, uh, who was one of the executive producers of the film, he um, he's really, really into sound. So he wanted to be a part of the, the sound editing process and the mixing. So he came to Ireland and then later he came to Copenhagen and was there throughout the whole sound process. He's got really great ears. It was very surprising, like just like he was so much into sound and um, I remember him writing me like in the beginning that yeah when when we meet an island then I'll tell you a few stories about some of these sounds and I was thinking okay that's gonna be great he'll like Bruce will probably come by for 20 minutes and talk about a few of the sounds and then leave again but then when he came to Ireland he was like yeah Peter I, I, I need to tell you these stories about the sounds and uh, then he came around for the, in the studio, and I think he was there for like five hours or something like that. And then going through all these old recordings and like, yeah, this sound, it's that was recorded in Sam's hotel room, and we, I, we like we were in his room, and then suddenly there was this wind coming in through the window, and we recorded that sound, and doesn't it sound cool? And yeah, listen, listen to this, and. So we went through all these different sounds, these different iconic sounds of Evil Dead. And yeah, a lot of that is actually in Evil Dead Rise as well. You talked about the, a bit of the history of the movie. It was supposed to premiere on streaming and then get moved to the cinema. But when I watched this movie, I thought like, if there ever was a horror movie you have to see in the cinema, this is the one. It was so like, you know, uh, meaty both visually and audially. I, I'm like, you know, I, I got a, I used to work in distribution. I saw the first ring. I got that feeling. Like, it's very hard actually to make a good looking, good sounding film also be scary. And you really succeeded on this one. But also, since you come from the Nordic tradition of a lot of times less is more, do you agree that it's actually a lot more challenging when you really start to add, you know, great visuals and a lot more sound it's it's almost harder to make a scary movie would you agree i definitely think that i mean for scary movies often the silences are the most scary but that's also why i really liked how lee approached this that he wanted the sounds to be very specific and precise so that when there's a lot of sound there then it's also telling a very precise story like Everything should have its own iconic sounds in the film, in a way. Like the record player should have a very specific sound. The elevator should have a very specific sound. I mean, and it was even down to, like, tiny details, like a foot in blood on the floor. Like, Peter, this this sounds, it, it, this sound needs to be more, like, precise. And I, I wanted to have more texture. And, like, so everything like had to be incredibly like textured and tactile and precise and 
that meant that even when a lot of sound is going on, then there's also a lot of detail. And that makes it, I think, also even creepier because it feels like you can almost feel the sound in a way. Instead of just being a wall of noise, it's really like... Um, it's it's like every every little sound is there for a reason. And Lee was just like constantly kind of pushing me and the rest of the sound team to really like play around with things and be creative and experiment. So um, for me as a Scandinavian who might be used to doing sometimes more minimal stuff, I think that... Um, this approach where like where the sound has to be there for a reason for me it really made sense here the only thing that was like a big difference was that like the sounds here were quite different than what you usually hear in a scandinavian kitchen sink drama i mean this is very much kind of like the bloodiest family drama you ever seen and actually when you talk about scandinavian yeah it's a real actual family tragedy so that's in the tradition if you take away everything like yeah it's like a it could, it's a large one trier tragedy in a, in a way yeah, like yeah. Told if, very... if, if ingmar Bergman took speed and loved blood then he would make a film like this have you had a conscious effort to move towards english-speaking uh, movies like hollywood movies is something you always wanted to work on to do I mean, for me, there's there's always been a lot of inspiration in like American movies, and um, but I also see a lot of inspiration coming from a lot of different places. I don't really, I mean, this whole thing about something being bad taste or popcorn movies, I've always felt like okay, I can be I can be just as inspired by watching. Uh, like a, a big Hollywood movie as I can be by watching a obscure uh, avant-garde documentary or like um, uh, hearing a crazy piece of music or uh, I really I really like how how there's so much variety out there and like and I like that in my own work as well that I get to do a lot of very very different projects I mean Sometimes documentaries, sometimes fiction films, sometimes dramas. I've also been part of a, f a few horror films before. Um, I like to do a lot of different things. And um, I think that is really inspiring to do a lot of different things. Um, but then at the same time, yes, I have more and more connections in the US. I've... Uh, I've been uh, mixing, I think, five or six times at Skywalker Ranch, for example. So I know the Star Wars sound library that you talked about. <laughs> uh, I actually know a lot of the people who worked on those films. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've, I mean, in that sense, I have uh, quite a lot of U.S. connections now. But I like this thing about, like, it's being able to work with people from a lot of different cultures. And also after COVID, uh, I think people have really realized like that you can, I mean, it doesn't matter where you are based in the world. You can kind of collaborate very closely and have Zoom talks and send files back and forth. And it, I, I really love that. I love that the world is becoming more international and i mean my sound crew i think we're like eight different nationalities on the sound crew i mean that's amazing i have a, a sound effects editor from lebanon i have a american sound effects editor i have an irish foley artist i have a, a spanish sound effect mixer i mean the the film world is very international now and i really love it what uh, surprised you the most and what did you learn during the process of uh, working on this movie? I I think I learned a lot about um, um, how to be very precise with sounds. Um, I think that uh, sound in like 
when you do a big project like this, which is the biggest project I've ever done, sometimes I feel when when hearing big blockbuster movies that it feels like so much is happening at once. Like there's big music, there's big sound effects. And I think something that I really learned from this project was how important it is to really have a very close connection to the director, to the picture editor and to the composer so that we really build things together and not on top of each other, but side by side. Uh, in Evil Dead Rise, the whole film, the sound, the music, the editing, it's very integrated together. And uh, for me, it was such a great lesson in what it, I mean, how important it is to collaborate closely. I really think that great filmmaking is really about being great at collaborating. Do you have any advice for a newcomer that wants to work as a sound designer? I think it's an amazing, there's so many amazing opportunities for doing sound now. It's so easy now to work with sound on your computer. It's very easy to go out and record a lot of sounds. Um, so I would really suggest like get hold of some software, play around on your computer, go out and record a lot of sounds and also listen to your favorite movies and find out, okay, so what is it I like about the sound in this film? I mean, what, what is it that's special? Is it, uh, is it the sound effects? Is it the way that sound and music plays together? What is it I like and how did they kind of do it? So try and find that kind of inspiration and then really play around with things. I mean, I think experimenting, for me, that's the big key to having fun with sound. You can do so many crazy experiments with sound and it's always super inspiring. And that was also one of the things I really loved about Evil Dead Rise is that there's so many crazy sound experiments that was part of the process and which is part of the film now. Have you prepared the Evil Dead Rise audio legacy hard drive? Are you? Is it ready? Will you continue working on it? Have you talked about what's next for the Evil Dead franchise? Lee actually has an idea for a sequel to this film. I... I don't think I'm allowed to share that, but uh, I bet that's going to have a lot of crazy sounds in it as well. Okay, Peter, it was a pleasure talking to you. If you want, shout out your crew, the international crew. Let's shout them out. <laughs> yeah. I worked with two mixers, uh, an Irish dialogue and, and music mixer called Garrett Farrell and um, a Spanish effect and Foley mixer called Gabriel Gutierrez. Um, we had the sound effects editors, Charles Maines from the US, Rana 8 from, um, from Lebanon, and uh, Thomas P. Paris from Denmark. Uh, I had my own assistant, Mikkel Nielsen, who was part of the whole process for eight months, and uh, we kept recording lots and lots and lots of sounds for this film. Um, and um, yeah, that's... that's uh, Then there's the Irish Foley artist, Quiver Doyle, who's amazing, um, and her team in Ireland. So yeah, that's some of the kind of the key players of the... of. The, the soundtrack. Thank you for listening. Please share this episode to anyone interested in international filmmaking and production. Other episodes in English have the word international in the title. For example, the director of the award-winning genre film Hatching, Hanna Bergholm, and two Swedish digital film directors talking about how they made films for cinema outside the system. <laughs>